Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois. And we have got quite a show for you today, folks. We're going to be talking about sweet corn. We're late in the season. Well, I wouldn't say late. We're mid and we're middle, middle season, kind of. I'm thinking late season because uh, in my mind, I'm like, I got to get my fall crop started here. So that's kind of where my brain's at right now. Um, but we're about middle of the summer here, first part of August, and we're going to be talking sweet corn. What What's going on right now, harvesting and so on. And to do this, we have our co-host with us every single week. We are joined by local foods educator, Katie Parker in Adams County. Hi, Katie. Hey, Chris. How's it going? Oh, it's been a day, but <laughs> I'm happy to be here with, with you and Ken chatting about sweet corn. So uh, how are you doing? I'm doing well. This weather makes you want to get ready for your uh, your fall, fall gardening too. Exactly. I'm like, okay, where's the apple cider? You know, where, where's the pumpkins? You know, we got to get going on this stuff here. Right. And someone who I know is just ticking off the days to cooler weather is horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, I am. It's, it's been hard to get up the last few days. Had the, the windows open and it's been, mm-hmm. it's been perfect sleeping weather. Mm-hmm. Absolutely perfect sleeping weather. I, I cannot stress that enough you should be sleeping with your windows open and unless you you have allergies or something <laughs> and that might be a bad idea <laughs> Take a little extra medicine <laughs> yes yes there you go um so uh ken and katie i must confess i've never grown sweet corn before i don't know much about it and i know both of you have had your hands in the dirt so to speak with this crop so if you don't mind I have some questions for you today. See what we can do. <laughs> All right. We're doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I have nothing to compare it to. The only thing I do with sweet corn is I eat it. I cook it and I eat it. And I, I do love sweet corn. Um, now, I suppose, could we like just clarify for a second here? Because um, this is more like, when I go into a classroom or something, kids are like, oh yeah, the corn out that's growing out there along the highway, you know, that's, that's the corn in the can, right? Or the corn on the cob. Uh, Katie, are we eating, is this all the same corn or there, you know, is this a difference here? Yeah, there is a difference between it. Uh, if you were to go out to many of those fields that you're talking about and eat one of those ears, it may not be very tasty and you might be missing a few teeth. Um, and <laughs> I definitely wouldn't want to eat it. Um, my grandma always said that when she was a kid, they would go out, uh, about the milk stage and it was soft enough that they could eat that. Um, but I still don't think it would have the flavor that we prefer with our sweet corn that we eat today. Um, so I definitely don't go out wandering in cornfields and, um, eating that, eating that corn, a lot of our sweet corn, you can tell a pretty good difference between that and field corn because uh, it's often much shorter uh, and it has a much larger tassel. So those are some good identifying factors. And what's a milk stage? Is that just, uh, it's not dairy cattle. It's not when the dairy cattle are ready for milk. It's... <laughs> right. We don't milk our corn. Uh, but so <laughs> Maybe in, we should. <laughs> corn milk. In a lot of our crops, we have like a um a vegetative and a reproductive stage so the reproductive stage is when it's starting to develop that uh tassel and ear um and so in our reproductive stages with corn i think there's about six different stages and typically uh, it'll all start with silks which are those things on the ear that kind of look like hair uh, when we would tassel, we'd always braid the silks. <laughs> we were just <laughs> destroying the process that needed to be done. Um, but yeah, it's the, the portion that kind of looks like hair. Uh, and then typically fertilization occurs. So the, the tassel of the corn plant sheds pollen that pollinates those silks and creates a, a corn kernel. So for each silk, you would expect a corn kernel. Uh, And so then those kernels start developing and typically it starts out with blister is the first stage and then milk is the the next stage after that. Um, So that can happen anywhere around, I think like 20 days after pollination. 
Um, and so if, if you're not great at identifying that milk stage, uh, that can be an identifier just 20 days after pollination. Or you can also peel back the husk of the corn um, of the ear and you can take your fingernail and kind of punch through the corn kernel and you'll notice that it's got like a, a milky substance to it. That milk that comes from the cow. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, sweet. Something similar to that. Yeah. Well, I've always... I've always thought there was more that we could get out of corn, and now I'm trying to get. I'll try milk. <laughs> How can we milk a corn kernel? <laughs> <laughs> We're milking a lot here, right? Including corn. <laughs> okay, so um, so sweet corn is definitely different than the field corn that we see growing along most of our roads and fields here in Illinois. Um, now, Ken, I'm, I'm curious too if corn sounds like it's wind pollinated. Does sweet corn benefit at all from pollinate, like an insect, or is does it not matter? Um, so as, as far as pollination of the actual ear goes, insects aren't really going to play a factor in that that, that pollen is falling to the ground. Um, it's going to land on those on those silks. I know out in my garden, I have seen bees uh, visiting those tassels of collecting pollen. It's probably not a major source for them, but it, they're, at least in my garden, bees will visit it, but it's not playing a factor as far as the actual pollination of the plant. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I think I've seen um, just again, walking by sweet corn, I've seen bumblebees and things like that playing in the tassel or not. In the, they're in the tassels, right? Cause that's where the pollen's at, not the silk. So they would be in the tassels. Okay. So Katie, we were talking before the show. Um, your boyfriend, Matt has taken to some sweet corn growing in the backyard. Yes. Um, and he's had, um, he's had a lot of questions. That's what you said. So, um, could you share maybe, so as if he's a first time sweet corn grower, maybe people listening like in myself would be first time sweet corn growers. Um, maybe some of the trials and tribulations that he went through that could help us also in the future. So I know the first thing that we talked about, um, it was, it was like weed control, right? And he was really worried about weeds. So uh, again, we're in August. You might not have to worry too much about weeds right now, but are weeds a big problem when it comes to corn? Um, they can be. So they provide competition to the plant. And so that can cut down on your yield uh, and then overall like your plant growing. Um, so he had some issues with weeds. Uh, I just went out and pulled them. He's not a fan of pulling weeds. So he was like looking for easier ways and he just wanted to spray it. And I'm like, oh, why don't we look for alternatives, you know? Uh, so I told him just to like uh, our neighbor uh, bags their yard. So they bag the, uh, the grass that they mow each week and it's full of nutrients because he's fertilizing all the time. So I was like, go, you know, kill two birds with one stone, get get some fertilizer from the, the grass clippings, and then also have some weed control. So um, he went over to a neighbor and he's been using that. He laid down some newspapers and some put that grass clippings over top of the newspapers. And that's really helped a lot, especially in between your rows. Um, and that, that helps out a lot too. That neighbor also sprays their yard. Um, and so I push uh, I try to educate Matt, who does not have an ag background or anything, on some things. And so that was one thing. He's like, well, won't it kill my corn if he sprays his yard? But oftentimes we're spraying our yard with um, herbicides that are going to kill broadleaf species such as dandelions, uh, broadleaf plantain, buckhorn plantain, um, weeds that have that kind of that bigger leaf. Um, so we wouldn't expect that that would kill our sweet corn as our as corn is in the grass family as well. So we got our weeds controlled. Uh, another thing too is if you're fertilizing your plants uh, and you have issues with weeds, you're also fertilizing your weeds. So that can cause issues with that because your your weeds will take up those nutrients and cause competition uh, and they can outgrow your plants as well. Okay. I, I remember Dr. Gruber here at WIU he's got some plots north of Macomb and he did for one of his corn, I don't know if it was sweet corn or field corn or what they grow. Um, he did a ground cover of clover 
and he just took a lawnmower between rows and just mowed. Mm -hmm. He said it takes a it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's really <laughs> hot too in the summer. Yeah, I used to work with um, a couple farmers in Iowa, and they were kind of the leaders in what Dr. Groover is doing. So the new thing is is they're planting corn in sixty inch rows again. Mm -hmm. um, so like our grandfathers would have done that, so that way they could hook the the horse up to the plow and they could use like a, a line to till the fields. Um, but now they're, they're going back to 60 inch rows and they're kind of trying to look for hybrids that do well in those wide rows. And then they're planting cover crops in between the rows. And then that way you can kind of get a dual purpose. Like you're keeping ground cover all throughout the field with those cover crops, but you're still able to get your, higher like production with growing corn rather than a cover crop all year round. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the former extension agent, I probably mentioned his name on the show before, Dick Weller here in McDonough County, he's in his 80s. I remember talking with him a few years ago and he said, in agriculture, what was old will be new again. Mm -hmm. You just wait. So that's interesting right. that you say that. That's it cool. is. It is very yeah. cool. Okay, so I mean, so in addition to weed control, are, should we be fertilizing? It's August 3rd right now. I mean, if we're getting, you know, our corn is beginning to set fruit, do we, should we throw down fertilizer? Yeah, I think it's kind of late in the season to be fertilizing, especially if you're like in the reproductive stage. I know Matt did a second planting and it's about knee high right now. Um, and so he's been putting some fertilizer down as he sees like some deficiencies um, but like Ken, Ken mentioned, he's never fertilized his corn and that's a good potential, especially with our productive soils in Illinois. If there is anything that corn like truly needed, it would really only be maybe nitrogen, uh, as nitrogen's not always as readily available in the soil. Um, in good years, we get quite a bit of mineralized, uh, nitrogen from the soil, but, um, in some years, that's not not quite as uh, promising. But this year, I would expect there's probably quite a bit of mineralization going on in the soil, and so you may not have had to even like provide any nutrients to your sweet corn. And usually, when you um, when you fertilize, if you're gonna put nitrogen down, usually it's when it's 12 to 18 inches tall. Mm -hmm. That's typically when you put that down as a side dress. Ken, do you stock up like a nitrogen rich source early in the season, like? Uh, like a, some type of poultry compost or I don't know, something like that? No, nope. we've, uh, we've grown cover crops for years. I thought it's really high nitrogen, but, um, and then we mulch our garden, let all that decompose. So, okay. and we've, and then we rotate all of our stuff. So we don't have the same stuff growing in the same spot every year. Um, and we've been using this garden for about five years now. So, mm -hmm. and I haven't really had to fertilize yet. So, but Katie, you had also mentioned this thing called lodging. Now, I know in addition to milking corn, corn does have to find a place to stay. Sometimes they go and they find a hotel and they lodge there. Am I got this right? Is this correct? What is corn lodging? Uh, they prefer to lodge at Motel 6, I think. Oh, that's <laughs> where we'll leave a light on for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. No. Um, so sometimes whenever we get some good uh, wind, especially with younger corn plants, they don't have a good root system established. And so the corn can blow over. Um, and so the first time Matt saw his corn lying on the ground, he was uh, not happy because he had oh, yeah. put all that work into it. <laughs> and he's like, are you kidding me? And so he thought he was going to have to go out there and stake up every plant. Uh, but usually like within 12 hours, you see the corn starting to stand up again. Uh, and so it's not quite an issue. I think part of his issue too, and it, and it can be an issue too with sweet corn or any type of corn when you're planting it is like your seed depth. So I don't know that he necessarily planted his seed deep enough. And so um, that can have an issue on like the ease of lodging as well. I've been investigating um, cedars that you push and it mm -hmm. seems like, like the earthway cedar, that might be a good one if he ever wants to do large plots of corn. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah. If he does too large, I hope he'll like get like a planter and maybe a two, two row planter or I don't yeah. know, a 
a tractor and two row planter or something. You might need a bigger yard, Katie. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just grow sweet corn over our entire yard. There you go. It's it is a grass, like you said. So <laughs> it may not be too sustainable. <laughs> um, it, and you had mentioned something about poor pollination before. So I mean. Ken, we had mentioned pollinators and things. It, was that an issue this year, Katie, with, with Matt's corn? Um, I saw a little, I saw one ear the other day. Um, so like usually poor pollination will result in like uneven kernel sizes. Or if you've ever noticed, sometimes you'll have um, just like big round fat kernels and there's nothing around them. Um, so I saw that a little bit. And his issue was, I think he had poor germination from the start. So he had um, like five of his maybe 24 plants pop up. Uh, so I think he maybe had some old seed and you need, so sweet corn needs like friends around it. It needs other sweet corn plants around it to ensure pollination. Um, and so five plants was pretty decent, but um, it could have been better, you know, um, so I would expect that's probably why he had some uneven kernel sizing and spacing. I'm just, I, I, I now I wish I had planted sweet corn sooner in my life. So yeah, this is, there's so much to learn. Okay. Um, so Ken, um, ha, when do you know sweet corn's ready to pick? Because I imagine right now it's sizing up and, you know, do you have to, after it's done milking, do you have to then, is there another? Is there, is there like a, a fruit juice stage? What what's next? How do I know when it's ready? So one way you can go out you can go out and kind of squeeze the ear and it feels kind of full. Um, that's a pretty good indication. The the silks will start drying up. So yeah, you know, think about the sweet corn you buy in the store. Um, that's one way. Pretty much with any vegetable, think about what it looks like when you buy in the store, and that's usually a good indication of when you want to harvest. So that silk will start drying. Um, the ear gets kind of full, and I'll usually <clears throat> when stuff starts getting to that stage, I'll peel back the the husk and and pop a few kernels and see if it's in the milk stage or not okay now i've heard a good sweet corn you can just eat that without having to cook boil whatever it just you know you shuck it take a bite it should be just as tender and juicy as it is if you would throw it in a microwave is that true does that or should i be cooking my sweet corn um, i've eaten it raw our kids have sometimes in the they're picking it though. They'll just eat a ear while we're picking. So yeah. we've all lived to tell the tale. It, it's, it's e I know it's easier to spread melted butter on a hot ear of corn, but I just, if it's good, it doesn't need butter. I think exactly. pre melt your butter and just dip it in there. <laughs> One needs to invent a cob sigh, uh, like shaped butter dipping dish. <laughs> um, okay. So if you know, you've got it picked, um, like Ken, you had mentioned you you eat it almost right away, but should so I, I have a pick. Do I need to do something? Do I need to shuck it right away? Do can I keep it in my kitchen counter with the it still you know fully clothed and it's 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 corn clothing? Um, well, how do I store this? So a little bit of that's going to depend on the type of sweet corn you're growing. Um, so there's kind of three main types: the standard, super sweet and sugar enhanced. Um, and those are abbreviated SU for standard, SH2 for super sweet, and SE is sugar enhanced. Uh, so your standard, that's kind of like your old time sweet corn. Uh, and that stuff starts, the, the kind of the quality, the sweetness starts declining rapidly. Um, so usually that stuff you pick and cook um, right away. You wouldn't want to store that more than a day. Um, otherwise you start losing a lot of that sweetness. Um, the super sweet um, and the sugar enhanced, those can store um, a little bit longer, um, several days if you needed to. It's, it's still probably best to, in general, just cook it right away or use it kind of that day um, just to be safe. Okay. Well, and then Katie, you had mentioned possibly being able to preserve corn. What, did, what are you and Matt thinking about for this year? What's, what's going to be the, the way to get corn in the middle of winter? Yeah, there's nothing better than sweet corn in the winter. So we've been, um, we just cook the corn. We pretty much blanch it uh, and then cut it off the cob and then put it in uh, freezer baggies 
to freeze it and hopefully enjoy this winter. Yeah, I, it sounds like a pretty simple process. You know, my mom, she's yeah. done that for years. Yeah, easy enough. And then, you know, at, at like mm, Christmas time or somewhere, you know, some holiday gathering, there's a stew that's made and you can tell there is fresh frozen, but fresh locally grown sweet corn mixed in with that. So it's awesome. I'm hungry. Um, okay. Other things that might occur with our sweet corn. Uh, Ken, you've probably never had a pest on your corn at all. So it's probably just, it's like Nirvana growing this corn. It's perfectly perfect in every perfect way. What? And any issues though? Something like that. Um, of course. So I, th I think a lot of times we're growing sweet corn for the squirrels, not for us, because we'll usually get one picking and then the squirrels find it and <laughs> we're done for the year. So um, in our yard, in our, in our garden, we have big issues with squirrels um, eating our sweet corn and I have not figured out <laughs> a good way to keep them out. Um, I thought about, we got, we bought some like the pa uh, paper lunch bags. I thought about going out there and, and bagging individual ears of corn to discourage them. So That's I haven't done idea. it yet. I haven't done it yet, but I may try that. Just try to keep them off. Um, earlier uh, this year, when, when things were silking, we had some issues with Japanese beetles um, going in and feeding on the silks, clipping those silks. Um, and that can be uh, another cause for some poor pollination if they clip those silks. Um, you're not going to get good pollination uh, for those kernels. Um, those are the kind of the two uh, big ones that, that I've had to, to deal with. Um, but there's others out there, um, raccoons, deer. We'll get into the corn. Um, corn earworm can be a big issue as well. A very common story I am told is that people will be They'll have this beautiful block of sweet corn. They know it's getting ready. Maybe they're going to go pick it on the weekend the next day. And they come back and raccoons have beset that block of sweet corn and they are stripped, torn to pieces and gone. Um, Ken, you said nothing. You said you didn't have any maybe remedy for squirrels. They're evil animals anyway. Um, <laughs> nature never intended them to evolve this far. Um, but the... The raccoons, Katie, uh, or deer, you know, do you and Matt have these issues? Any, any solutions or ideas? Luckily, we live in town, so we don't have a lot of issues with, like, the deer. Uh, raccoons, we see one occasionally, but knock on wood, they've left our sweet corn patch away or left it alone. Um, but a lot of times you'll see, like, people put um, electric fence, usually a couple wires around the base, um, to keep raccoons out. Um, with deer, you could do the same thing, but you're obviously going to have to do it up a little bit higher because the deer can step over something that raccoons wouldn't be able to. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of times it's electric fence. Uh, Peggy Doty told us, I don't know if you guys recall, like uh, talk radio usually keeps raccoons away. So if if you don't have access to electric fence, that could be an option. Just keep a, a radio on top radio uh, throughout, the, throughout the night for a few nights around uh, when you would expect your sweet corn to be ripening. Uh, that might be a tactic to keep them away as well. <laughs> I've even heard folks, they take a piece of tin foil, smear it with peanut butter and put it on the electric fence so the electricity current still travels within that tinfoil to encourage animals to lick it. And when they oh, lick it, no. <laughs> yeah, they get a shock. And so it is a conditioning thing that they, they so even though they potentially have some meat with your sweet corn. That's, there you go. <laughs> poor, poor animals. Smells, somebody fried some sweet corn and uh, <laughs> something else here too. So yeah. Um, but so yeah, that's might be another possible thing if you want to, uh, I guess just, Condition your critters, pest critters, to stay away. Even though they want the corn, they'll go for the peanut butter first and realize don't mess with that fence. So keep your pets away from it. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And your, you and your kids. Mm -hmm. Well, kids, you know. Uh, I got shocked so many times as a kid going underneath the cow fence. So I'm still here. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> Ken, when it comes to Japanese beetles, did you do anything to control them? Um, this year, um, I did spray once because uh, they were getting pretty bad, but 
some years we only have one or two, you know, or a handful. I just go out and hand pick them or, or sometimes just pop the heads off and throw them on the ground and, and stuff. But a lot of times we don't, we don't have enough in our yard to really worry about. Um, this year we had a few more than normal. So I did spray, but if, if somebody had quite a few, they'd probably want to spray um, or, or find some way to get them off the other, either hand picking or spraying. Uh, Cause you don't want those clipping all those silks. Cause you'll get some pretty poor um, fill yeah. on your ears. Yeah. You mentioned you twist their head off something like Jean-Claude Van Damme in a movie does something like that action movie. I've I did that the other day. They were all over my marigolds and the darn thing, something like shot out of the Japanese beetle. There's a stain on my shirt. It won't wash out. So anyway, it was gross. Um, it's probably too much <laughs> graphic detail for this show. Anyway. Just, just use your thumbnail. Put them in yes. your, your fingers and just pop the head off. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, okay. So corn earworm, there's been a couple local farmers that have said, come on, folks. It's not that big a deal. Get over it. It's a, what is it, Ken? What is a corn earworm? What is it, type of insect? It is a, a caterpillar and a moth. Okay. Um, it's also called tomato fruit worm if it's getting into your tomatoes. Oh, so, okay. So same, same, same insect causing problems on both of those. And with corn earworm, usually you're going to find that at the tip of the ear. Um, it's when they land their eggs on the silks and those caterpillars will hatch and work their way into that ear corn and start feeding on the tip. And sometimes you may see like a, a line of kernels missing where that corn earworms travel down and there'll be frass or poop in there. Um, a lot of times, if it's just on the tip, you can cut that out and, and eat it. Mm. Or if you miss it, you've got a little extra protein. Talk meaty about corn. meaty corn. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So corn or earworm, I've never seen it to be a big deal. I'll pull the thing off. Yeah, you see the frass and the there's the little caterpillar there. Just chop it off and I toss it in the grass and call it good. Um, it, if people wanted to spray something like that, because it's a caterpillar, would it be something like a BT spray on your silks? Yeah, that and yeah, basically anything that you're going to spray for <clears throat> capillaries, BT, other stuff. Um, I think usually you do that when your corn starts to silk to kind of protect that when they're not, when they're out laying eggs. Okay, okay. Now, uh, Katie, I know this was kind of new to to me and you, but Ken has experience with this um, corn smut fungus. Sounds awful, <laughs> but Ken eats it. Um, uh, I, I don't know, Katie, would, would you eat corn smut fungus? Is that something on your uh, palate? I mean, I guess if I didn't know that it was corn smut, I would, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe not. Yeah. Well, tell us about it, Ken, because I'm all ears. So it's also called Huitlahoche. Um, I think is, is the, the Mexican uh, term for it. And basically it's just a fungus that infects um, Typically, the, <clears throat> the kernels on the corn, you can't get it on the silks, and I think the stems sometime. Uh, but basically, you just kind of get this big, <clears throat> swollen, kind of silvery-looking mass uh, on your ears of corn. Um, and if, if you pick that at the right time while it's still silver, um, you can pick that um, and eat it. Um, so we got some in our sweet corn um, last year. We can put a picture of that um, in this for those of you on YouTube. Um, See, so I just picked that off. I was excited about it. <laughs> Most people probably aren't, but <laughs> um, so I picked that and then what we do, sauteed it with some onions and stuff and ate it on tacos or made uh, quesadillas with it. So it's kind of an earthy, mushroomy taste. I thought it was good. I should have, I should have saved some and inoculated all my sweet corn this year. Yeah, it, but... you could have passed it. You could have given some to Matt. So that would have been, I don't know. He might've been upset though. <laughs> so I, I think most people aren't too happy about it, but there are people who will inoculate their corn um, so they can get it and, and sell it and stuff. And you can buy a canned, um, usually in the, the ethnic aisles of grocery stores sometimes. Interesting. Well, I, I'd be willing to try it. So we have quite a menu stacked up for us, you know, if, you know, for next year, I think we have, a, we have month long cicadas. cooking specials. Yes. Cicadas. <laughs> Well, how, how did you pronounce that? Quetlahoche? Quetlahoche. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing it right. <laughs> I don't know how to grow sweet corn, so this is, this is all new to me. So, oh, uh, yeah. 
But this was a lot of great information. Uh, last year, Katie, you wrote an article on growing sweet corn for the blog. Um, we'll make sure to post a link to that if folks want more information. Um, I just, you know, want to thank both Katie, Ken, for just sharing your knowledge, your, your vast unending knowledge on sweet corn. I, I've learned a lot and I hope our listeners have learned a lot as well. We'll have to have a sweet corn growing challenge next year. Yes. Mm -hmm. We can grow the most corn smut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a joke there that I won't say. So, um, well, the Good Growing Podcast is produced by Wendy Ferguson and edited, edited, I'll edit that out, by me, Chris Enroth. Uh, again, Ken, Katie, great to see both of you. It's good to see you too. Good to see you, Chris and Katie. Let's do this again next week. Oh, we shall do this again next week. I think we're going to be talking to someone about hemp production. If not, we're going to have one heck of a show for you, whatever it is. Uh, but, you know, listeners, thank you for being here and doing what you do best, and that is listening. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, watching. And as always, keep on growing.